I'd like to do now is I'd like to invite Sarah McCain Bartlett. I'm just asking Sarah to pop up here, show her video. Good morning, Sarah. How are you? Hi, David. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great. Everybody, please let me introduce uh, Sarah McCann Bartlett. She's the CEO and Managing Director of the Australian Human Resources Institute, also known as ARI. Um, it's great to be with Sarah. Uh, she has a great story to share today. ARI is Australia's professional body for HR practitioners that we all know and love. Uh, Human Synergistics has a long partnership with ARI. We've been working with them for many, many years, and I'm super excited to have Sarah here with us today to share not only her story, uh, which is gonna share some great data, but also the story of Ari and what's been going on at Ari. Sarah is very experienced. She knows the circumplex very, very well. Uh, and she leads trade bodies and her passion is really helping members achieve their goals and really to make a difference um, for her members. So please join me in welcoming Sarah. Uh, Sarah, welcome, I'm just gonna, get some things happening here. Uh, Sarah, welcome. Over to you. Thanks, David. It really is a pleasure to be here today. I'm working on Boonarong country today, and I acknowledge the Boonarong people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. As David's intimated, today I'm going to take you on two separate yet related journeys. I'm going to start with my own leadership development journey over a number of years. And then I'll talk about the work we've been doing at the Australian HR Institute over the last two years to create a constructive workplace culture that really supports the transformation journey that we're on. Up front, the reason I've connected these case studies is to provide you with an example of the links between leadership, workplace culture, and delivery of business outcomes. And hopefully by the time I've finished, you'll be able to see that connection in this case. So I'm going to kick off with my own leadership development story. Here's my LSI 2, a 360 assessment of my leadership style from 14 years ago. Extremely red not very blue. And if you take out achievement, not at all blue. I was a member of the executive team in the organization I was working at at that time, and I had positional power. My thought processes, my perfectionistic tendencies aligned really closely with those of the CEO. My vertical team was performing, and I was really able to push the organizational agenda forward through influence, my ability to strategize and my ability to operationalize. And we got stuff done. But often that was to the detriment of my relationships with my colleagues. And as an organization, before we did the LSI, we just couldn't work out why we weren't performing as effectively as we thought we should as an executive team. We talked about it all the time and it really was the ambition of the CEO to create a high performing executive team and it wasn't working but then we started a transformation program and I was leading it we were bringing two organizations together with a central shared services function the new and expanded executive team had to work together and had to work effectively together otherwise we wouldn't have succeeded so to become more effective as a team we kicked off our LSI journey all executives and first line managers. And not surprisingly, as you've seen, my LSI reflected a lot of red. Interestingly, my results from my direct reports were more blue. The red really showed up strongly in my peer responses. So what did I do? First of all, I had to own it. The debrief was done by, by a human synergistics consultant and we had quite a few sessions to unpack where I was and importantly, where I needed and wanted to go. 14 years ago, I was a bit younger. This was a revelation to me. And it really helped me start to unlock greater self-awareness and grow my emotional intelligence. I did have a burning platform, which was also really important because I knew that I couldn't drive this organizational transformation without a supporting culture change. And that started with the leadership team, which included me. So personally and organizationally, I had a lot of work to do. 
I selected power and oppositional to really work on. And of course, bringing these down was key to increasing humanistic, encouraging and affiliative styles in the blue. Now, I was really fortunate because I was supported by an external coach. He helped me set myself behavioral tasks. Sometimes I executed poorly and I fell back on my old behaviors and styles. But over time, a more constructive style became more natural and comfortable for me. Organizationally, we commenced a culture change program and focused on embedding a new set of values. Our executive relations became more affiliative and our operational delivery improved. And I left the new organization and its shared services function in a pretty good place. So fast forward 14 years, and here's my LSI from 2020. And I do have to say a big shout out to Human Synergistics and their filing system, because I didn't have my LSI from 14 years ago, but David managed to find it. And here are my two LSIs side by side. One thing I will say, looking back at that first LSI and knowing what I know now, I would have done some things differently in 2008 and um, those years post. We didn't, as an organisation, embed the LSI terminology in our everyday conversations about our own and other styles. And that's something that I've learned is, is really useful. We also didn't share our LSIs among the executive team. Now, possibly because there was a lot of red there. And um, I think one of the earlier speakers did note that um, when she first did her LSI, she was um, perhaps slightly embarrassed. Um, and, and, you know, that's something that we all have to get over. But it is a very challenging thing to do. It, but extremely rewarding exercise to build understanding, um, support and trust. And retrospectively and reflecting on how we're approaching our culture change at ARI, I think that made our journey back then harder not doing that, that share. I hope you can see why I say for me, having the opportunity to undertake that early LSI was a real gift for me. So on to Ari. Um, David's already introduced Ari. Most of you will know who we are, the Australian HR Institute. Um, we set standards for the practice of HR through the Australian HR Capability Framework and Professional Certification. And our team of around 50 people, plus our very large team of volunteers, supports our members through a number of activities. I started at ARI in February 2020, six weeks before the pandemic reached Australia. And as that started to bite and we were thinking about and looking at the challenges and the changes we were facing, we, ARI's executive team and our board, realised that just on its own, COVID was going to generate significant change and disruption. So we started to ask ourselves whether this provided us with an opportunity to drive wider change for our organisation and in particular for our members. There was nothing wrong with ARI, but there was a huge amount of opportunity. And like a lot of organisations, it was time to review our member proposition, our systems and processes and our products and services. So we decided to use the pandemic as a springboard to create a new transformed organisation. And we developed a transformation model. This is the early transformation model that brought together the key drivers that would change ARI. And they were our people, our culture, significant underlying digital change, and of course, putting our members at the centre of, of everything that we do. And we wanted to create greater connectedness, improved content and learning, uplift professionalism, professionalism in HR and deliver an insights organisation. And so in the middle of 2020, ARI's transformation program was born. As an organisation, ARI had completed a full OCI in July 2019, before my time. So about six months after we kicked off our transformation program, we ran a Culture Pulse survey, and that allowed us to compare our results with July the year before. The two or three areas that we'd been really targeting 
to start our culture journey were communication and inter-team collaboration. And as you can see, we definitely saw positive movement. Now, because we're in the midst of a pandemic and a major transformation program, it was hard to separate out the drivers of this change. And one of my underpinning leadership principles is openness and supported by clarity. So we discussed our transformation, the changes we'd be making in detail and the why constantly at weekly staff meetings. All executives played a role in these briefings. So it was very, very clear we were working as one team. We opened up our books, our financials to employees and we ran regular Q&A sessions with employees where no questions were off limits. When I started at ARI, I wrote weekly blogs to staff, but as soon as we went into lockdown, I produced them daily, again, creating connection, communication and, and sharing information. And in that isolation period, it was really important for everyone to know what was going on. To support members, we set up a, a private members LinkedIn lounge where I posted a video to members every week. And for the RE team, what they heard on the lounge provided a consistent tone and approach to when I and the executive communicated them. And when you're challenged online, it's out there for everyone to see. So I made sure to respond openly and constructively to every challenge comment, suggestion that we got from members and others um, online. And again, that reflected how I and the executive team deliberately communicated with the RE team. As an executive team, we kept up our leadership development journeys using our LSIs as really the underpinning base level with the objective of, of creating a high performing, high trust executive team, and then driving that through the management team. And we did share our LSIs. We talked a lot about it. We talked a lot about the reasons for doing so, but also what the opportunities and benefits of, of doing that um, were. So that clear and open communication was a really big part of that and trust. As part of our transformation, we established a culture stream and created a cross-functional organizational wide culture team led by Rosemary, our GM of people and culture and participated in by myself and our GM of transformation to indicate how important this work was to link it culture and transformation to link the two together and to provide a direct communication through the whole organization. The first thing that we worked on as the culture stream was a new set of values and behaviours, and you can see them here on the slide. And then the team worked really hard to embed them in the organisation. We talked about them, we made them a part of our everyday conversations, and we shared and we still share stories and case studies. Then we built a new internal capability framework that aligned to our transformation and culture goals. This led to the creation of individual development plans through the whole organization, supported by the growth of a coaching, co a coaching culture where all people leads are expected as part of their people management roles to have regular ongoing development and coaching discussions with every person in their, in their team. We then went back and culture pulsed. Maybe I've just made up a, a new word again. You can see the three years of data for the causal factors on this slide. And given what I've told you, the upward and downward communication uplifts should be no surprise, positive and easy to understand. And I'm really pleased about the inter-unit coordination as well. We did see a slight drop in participative goal setting potentially as a result of our transformation, because at that point in time, the work program was quite focused on systems and process. And so it had very tight project management um, and deadlines around it. But all of this is about our members and delivering more effectively and better for them. At the end of last year, we've reached our highest membership level ever. Our LinkedIn lounge community continued and continues to thrive. We'd created a new series of short courses using blended learning and we'd launched our new learning management system.
This year, we turned on our new digital systems, a new CRM, a MEM portal, a website, and a finance system. And we also launched our new Australian HR capability framework and the supporting capability assessment tool. And we've just gone live with two new pathways to RE certification, REHR certification for senior leaders. We've still got a long way to go on our transformation journey. And our ambitions are really big. But our culture change program supported by a focus on constructive leadership behaviours has really been one of the drivers of our successes to date. And I hope that this has provided, um, as I suggested at the start of this presentation, an example for you of the links between leadership, workplace culture and delivery of positive business outcomes. David, I think we've got time for a couple of questions. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. Um, outstanding. And the, the questions are flowing. Um, I'm really heartened by the link you've shown between leadership and culture. And thank you for your openness and transparency. One of the first questions that I saw pop up was, what would you do earlier with the wisdom of hindsight? Earlier in my own my own journey and my own leadership journey and um, what I would recommend for others is some of the things that I, I noted during my presentation. Um, I would really be far more open about my own leadership styles. I would share more widely. Not only would I share with um, my peers, I would also be sharing with my team because talking about it embeds it. Talking about it creates action, creates change, creates understanding, and also drives that link between the way we behave as individuals actually changes the way we act as an organisation um, and the way we behave as an organisation, which um, is a real driver of culture change. I also talked about language. And one of the things I love about the Circumplex is its, um, is its simplicity. Um, I've got an absolute shocking memory. And all I can really remember is, is the colours, blue, green and red. Blue constructive, red aggressive, and um, green, I call it passive aggressive. Um, and I know they, they're not your language, David, and you're looking slightly horrified, but that's the language that, that sticks in, in my head. So being able to talk about um, people's responses and just very, very simply talking about red, green, and, and blue actually starts to embed um, those conversations um, in the organisation. Now, David, you'll be um, quite um, relieved to know that in detail one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, I actually do use the language slightly better. But again, using the language um, throughout the organisation and, and linking that to your values and behaviours as well, so that people can actually see personal style um, or individual style um, leadership behaviours, values and behaviours, um, culture and business outcomes. It all starts to flow together in a really, really nice um, framework. Fantastic. And look, as a reformed perfectionist, we shouldn't get too perfectionistic about the language, should we? Um, <laughs> there is another question that's come uh, flowing in uh, and people were interested in your pulse data and seeing that great movement. Uh, how often should we be pulsing? We're asking ourselves that question at, at the moment. And for us, as um, myself coming in as a, a new CEO, um, COVID kicking off a transformation program, really wanting to change the behaviours in the executive team and the relationships in the executive team and then through the organisation. That was why we did three in pretty quick succession. So we had um, July 2019, which was the full OCI. I wasn't there, but a, a pulse in um, 
the second half of 2020 and then um, again in 2021. Um, we think it's probably time to repulse now. Um, we've had, just like everybody has, um, high voluntary turnover in the last um, six month period. And um, we are just talking about is now the right time or do we just want to settle down slightly and then pulse? Um, but we do think that the frequency certainly of pulsing um, just gives you that um, data to ask yourself, are we on track? What do we need to focus on? Um, where do we need to perhaps just um, make a, a slight adjustment to, to that journey and to that plan? Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. And one more question that's popped up. What do you believe are the, is the biggest challenge facing HR professionals in the next 12 to 24 months? I'm going to give you a couple of answers, so I'm not going to give you one, one big one. Um, I do think that um, HR is the one of the professions that has been supporting everybody else through the pandemic and through the, the change that has been happening. We um, all thought that um, as the urgency of the pandemic actually eased, as we started to move back to the new normal, um, that that pressure on HR would ease. But what we've found is that we've got um, making hybrid work work. And at the moment, we're still very, very much in experiment an experimentation phase. And that's um, really, really tough for HR. Um, we're seeing that there's a lot of tension within organisations at the moment, um, potentially with a number of or a lot of CEOs saying, well, I just want it to go back to what it was. And employees saying, actually, we found a new way of working. And HR is sitting in the middle trying to resolve that tension, but also trying to be really strategic and say, but what is the future of our workplaces and our, and our work? And how do we actually make that, that work together? And so that experimentation phase is actually really, really tough with that tension underlying. Um, whether or not you believe that there's been a great resignation or there is a great resignation, certainly um, we poll on LinkedIn, on our LinkedIn lounge, our members every month about what their um, voluntary turnover is. And it is really, really high. Um, the change that we've seen since October 2020 is absolutely incredible and um, it's not going down. Um, two months ago, it did start to, to dip slightly, but um, May and June have gone back up again. And that has just kept HR absolutely frantically busy. Um, and it's in the HR team as well. So we're seeing high turnover within the HR profession as well. Um, so they're leading to um, those three factors, HR is tired, burnt out, and is a lot of people are wondering what on earth are they going to do um, to support themselves? Who's, who is actually supporting them? It has been a really, really tough time. But as we start to move forward, um, what we're starting to see economically and financially in business is a lot of stress high inflation, so high business costs. Um, Reserve Bank trying to put the brakes on um, inflation, which is going to have um, an effect on um, economic growth. Demand from a consumer perspective is going to go down as um, we see uh, people tightening their, consumers tightening their belts and having higher um, mortgage payments. So as we look into um, next year, what we're saying as Ari is that um, people and HR were really at the centre of our pandemic response, but HR is actually going to have to start to really get it, get do a deep dive in those analytics business cases and actually really um, hone up on the language of the CFO because I'm really concerned that we're going to revert to typical CFO recessionary type behaviour, which is get out their red pen and cross off any line, any cost line that um, 
they possibly see as discretionary. And we know that typically, and, and, and um, not to be dismissive of the CFO, but we know typically that a lot of those cost lines actually do are to do with learning development and other people programs. That can't happen because actually people are at the center of our workplace going forward and certainly at the center of our recovery, um, economic downturn or not. Wonderful. Uh, what a great response. People are definitely at the center. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, thanks for taking time out of it. I know your very, very busy schedule uh, to be with all of us today. Um, thank you once again. Um, just prior to going to our next speaker, um, I thought as following on from Sarah's question there, we go to one more poll um, and I'll just launch the poll. How important do you think culture is to your organization's success? You can see the answers rolling in. So this is a good comparison question compared to what we had in our first poll question. I'll give it three seconds for a couple more people to pump in. And it looks like we are there. So I'll just end the poll. And we've now got uh, almost 80%. Um, and I'll share the results uh, so they'll pop up here. Almost 80% um, believe it's the most important uh, part of our future success. No surprise and interesting comparison back to where we had uh, mid twenties who were focused on culture. Uh, so I'll just stop sharing that and uh, remove the poll. So as.